everybody. Uh, welcome to the Lightning Talks. Our first uh, speaker is going to be Mike Vince. Uh, so, Mike, the mic is yours. All right. Uh, let's see. So, I'm back. I uh, decided to do a Lightning Talk at the last minute. So, uh, forgive the uh, low quality slide. All right. So I just wanted to go over some of those uh, recent improvements that were made to ECHO uh, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there were three improvements, the ECHO parameterized type, ECHO enum, and redact true. Uh, first off, the ECHO parameterized type, which allows parameters for custom types to be included on a per field basis. Uh, the parameters, parameters are specified in the schema field definition and they are, those parameters are then passed in, into the cast, load, and dump functions. Uh, as, the, as far as the uh, type, this is the old uh, or the original version of ECHO type. Uh, we can see we specify ECHO UUID uh, and the cast gets that data when that, uh, those values are uh, when that uh, when a field of that value is, is cast, uh, but you can't specify anything specific anything on a per field basis. So to compare that to the parameterized type, uh, here you can see uh, there are two uh, fields being uh, specified. Both are parameterized types. So the parameterized type is only is only defined once. There's one module that exists, and uh, on the two different fields, it can have two different values or two different uh, parameters, sets of parameters. And then you can see in the uh, cast call that when you're writing your logic to cast, you can take that, get that information. So if your uh, options are uh, different on different fields, you can then, you then don't have to create a new parameterized type for each one of your fields with those, uh, those uh, chain differences. Uh, the first parameterized type that went in with the same pull request was ECHO enum, uh, which allows you to work with atoms and schemas. Uh, it allows it stores those atoms as strings in the database, and then retrieves them retrieves them out of the database and, and automatically converts them to atoms. So that that's what you're working with right when you when you enter a repo dot all repo dot cat. Uh, it casts strings safely, so if someone tries to cast a string that isn't one of your specified values, it won't cause a uh, atom overflow. Uh, so here uh, is an example of that. If you wanted to, if you want to use uh, an enum field, you'd specify it this way, um, simply saying which values are are legal for uh, for that field. And then, as you can see, here's some some uh, Three, three cast calls. The first one, we're taking the atom foo and changes allowed. The second one, we're taking the atom, uh, the string foo as a value, and then that is converted to the atom foo. So if you're uh, pulling in values from Phoenix uh, and you want to take those string values and convert them to atoms, it works. Uh, and then, but then it's also protected because if someone sends a string that's not one of the allowed values, allowed atoms, it'll reject it in the change set. Uh, and then the third thing was the uh, redact field on uh, on ECHO, which is, is also added. You specify this redact uh, value in the schema field. It redacts the values in two places. The first one is when you're inspecting the schema instance, and I'll show you that in a second. And the second one is that it redacts values and changes when you're inspecting a change set. And so this is, uh, as you can see here, it's specified simply by saying redact true on the field. Uh, here we have our password is redacted, our username is not. And so we'll take a look at a couple uh, different ways of, uh, of that this, this shows up. In the first one, we, we are casting that redacted schema module uh, with uh, username and password. And you can see that when we did the inspect, so I, when IEX inspects that, it uh, goes through the changes and says, you know, you, you told me to redact this password field, so I'm going to I'm going to 
redacted inside the changes so that it doesn't get exposed when that value is in a change set. And then the other one is simply if you inspect the actual schema itself and it has a password in it, uh, that password will not show up as one of the fields in the inspect uh, protecting that, that value. Uh, I go into this uh, more on the Thinking Elixir podcast episode 11 that came out uh, this week. And if you have any more questions, my GitHub and Twitter uh, is there. And I'd uh, love to talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm going to clap for all the people that is watching you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, OK, let's see who it's going to be next. Um, Next, uh, we have Zach Daniel. Hey, Zach. Welcome hey, to the Zach. stream. Hello. Hello there. All right. Am, am I up? Should I just get started? You are up. Like millions of people are, is watching you right now. <laughs> all right. All right. That's good to know. Well, I have something very informal uh, prepared. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Yep. That's desktop one. Okay, so <clears throat> what we're going to be looking at today is something that I uh, wasn't able to get to uh, in my talk tomorrow for the ASH framework. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be highlighting um, the DSL and the way that you can extend the DSL uh, if you're using ASH in your own application. So uh, what you can see here, this is an example of what a resource might look like. Uh, let me go ahead and go to a simpler resource. Okay. So uh, this resource has uh, DSL sections, is what you'd call these. This JSON API section, a policies section, an action section. And then these sections can have two things. They can have uh, options like this. This is an option. Uh, and they can also have entities. So this is an entity here. And the distinction doesn't matter too much for somebody using the DSL, but when you're trying to design something for the DSL, then you care. So uh, what I'm gonna show here is uh, that the documentation for this stuff is all sort of up uh, on Hexdocs. So if you're interested in creating an extension to Ash, essentially adding extra configuration to a resource or building a custom extension because you're using it, um, this is the way that you would do that. Uh, so you would go to take a look at the uh, Ash DSL entity and section documentation um, to see sort of like what kind of fields are available. So what I'm going to kind of breeze through quickly is uh, how you might add a custom section. Maybe let's say you've got a data import that you do. It's just your own thing. Like there's, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with like the basic stuff that Ash offers, but you want a place to sort of put the configuration for your custom import. So I'll show you what that might look like. Um, and so the way we'll do this is we'll go ahead and put this, we'll put this in extensions slash maybe uh, not, let's not call it import, let's call it uh, ETL. And then we'll say slash extension dot ES. All right, so I spelled that word wrong. Also, it thinks that that is a folder. So let's delete that. And let's create a file. So here we've got our helpdesk.extensions.etl.extension. This is probably a little bit much. We'll just call it ETL, actually. And so what we will do in the general pattern for how you do this is you'd, you'd create a section. Maybe we'll call it ETL. And this is an ash.entity.section. Uh, and this section, we can take a look at the docs here, to see kind of what our options are. Um, so we'll, first we're gonna start off with just a name. And I think that's kind of, if I recall correctly, that's all we really need um, to get started. So we'll give it a name, call it ETL, and then we will use ash.dsl.extension and we will pass in the sections option and we'll pass in the ETL section. Um, <clears throat> that's right, this is sorry, ash.dsl.section. And then uh, 
So I think that this is actually all that we're going to need to see that sort of in action. We can say uh, help desk extensions .etl. Um, and then right here we can say etl do, and this isn't going to do anything um, on its own. It doesn't do anything, but if we were to go into help desk, um, we should be able to see when it compiles. Um, so we can say uh, ash example or sorry help desk. Uh, uh, we called this is help desk dot yeah so we'll call this oh yeah so there is actually one other thing you need to do um, specifically you need to define some way to actually get this configuration out um, we need that we need to add an option so we'll say let's say this I'll add one option just to kind of show you what that look, might look like or one entity um, and we'll call it like a, a field that you're going to be importing so we say ash dot bsl dot entity field we have to give it a target. So we'll call this helpdesk.extensions.etl.field. Uh, and that's essentially just the struct that we're targeting. And we'll give it a schema. We'll give it, each field needs to have a name, type atom. We can give it like a, a doc string here if we want, or we can give it, um, we can say it's required. We can also, uh, and also make it a argument, which will make sense here shortly. Um, the same name. Okay. So this is our field argument to our ETL section. So we'll put it up here and then we can say entities uh, taking the field in right there. And then we will do a, we'll, we'll define a way to actually get the stuff out of it. So we'll take a resource like this. Right. Um, so that has to be a list. So we can say extension or ash.dsl.extension get field or get entities and then we will pass it the resource and then this is at ETL. Uh, I think this is actually all we need right here, ETL. Um, <clears throat> Cool. So now we can go into our user section here and we should be able to say field. Oh yeah, one, one last thing. We need to create the actual field entity. This uh, target that we put in right here needs to be a struct. We'll give it a name field uh, like we did over here. You can see it has a name. Um, and now in our user, we can say field, uh, let's say user has like a read, or sorry, user has like a ID. So there's an ID field in our ETL system. Um, it doesn't like that because undefined function field, uh, let's see, name field, entities field. Well, I may have done something wrong, um, <clears throat> but I think I'm probably pushing my five minutes the idea here is that you're supposed to be able to, and I've done it like a million and one times, um, but help this set extension study to that field. Yeah, I've done something wrong. Um, but the main point is that you can use these extensions to uh, add, um, help this set extension study. Did I, did I, I think I typed something wrong here in the field. Let's see. Interest that extension study to that field. Typos, the everyday problem. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, I have a typo, but this would work. You should normally. Oh, wait, here we go. Nope, it's still broken. <clears throat> All right, oh, Zach. Well. I think that yep. we are running out of time. We're running out of time, but this yeah. is how you would define a custom extension, and it normally goes better than if this went. So thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Zach. Okay, up next, we have Hal Fulton. Hal, are you there? I'm here. All right, so go ahead. Okay, you don't get to see me because I, I haven't had the haircut in months. I look like Beethoven, but I'm going to share my screen. And I don't look like Beethoven in a good way. 
uh, no composing skills. But, okay, I'm hoping you can see that. Um, yes, we can. Great. My name is Hal Fulton. I'm not well known in the Elixir community, but I'm still fairly well known in the Ruby community. And what I am talking about is the book that I started more than four years ago and I'm still working on. And if you don't know who I am, I wrote uh, one of these books. Uh, it's widely rumored to be the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, but I assure you that is not true. Uh, so anyway, you might know this guy better than you know me, Johnny Wynn. He is um, very big in the Elixir community. And uh, I had the idea of writing a book that would help Ruby programmers learn Elixir. And in the process of Googling, you know, which I probably should have done sooner, I found that somebody else had had the idea at least two years earlier than I had, and it was Johnny. So he and I talked to each other and said, well, we should join forces. So we did that and we started something, but it was going very slowly, very sluggishly, I should say. And Johnny, uh, dropped out of the project to deal with like family and life and all those other things. And since I don't have a family or a life, I was the perfect person to continue. Um, no disrespect to Johnny. He's very knowledgeable. He's a real Elixir expert, a great guy. Um, but he didn't have time to write a book. And so now this is all on me. However, in the last four years of my life, you know, some things have been going on and you may have heard the old saying, life is what happens while you make other plans. And I assure you that is very true because very little of the things that happened in the last four years were planned, you know, least of all COVID-19, which affects all of us. So, I'm using these things as sort of excuse for why I'm still writing this thing. So I would say that I'm about 75% finished. That's you know a real seat of the pants guess because how do you measure something like that? Um, you especially can't measure the length of a chapter you haven't written yet. And some of them are, you know, not even begun, although you may be half of them are even finished or either finished or begun. Anyway, if you are familiar at all with the Ruby way and my own writing style, you might find more of the same things that you're used to and have come to love or hate in my writing, such as gratuitous alignment of comments for no reason whatsoever. Maybe it will, um, you know, please the OCD in you or irritate the heck out of you if you don't have OCD. You'll also find some fairly cool drawings, like in this ex uh, explanation of tail call recursion and tail call optimization. You'll find some Venn diagrams, which I have formed a habit of using lately, because more and more in our society, People just don't understand Venn diagrams and, and don't appreciate them. So you'll also find a fairly cool bot game that you can watch in real time where bots are playing a sort of capture the flag game. If I can get all the bugs out of it and get it to work properly, you'll find numerous kinds of geeky Easter eggs um, only about half of which I've named here, like Money Python and Star Trek and Princess Bride and pop culture references and everything you could ever not want, including good puns and bad puns, good puns, I don't know, either, either kind, both kinds. Uh, now here's the progress. 
I, I don't have the chapter numbers here, but they are in order here. And I start with zero, which is a really geeky computer science joke. And I titled the chapter zero, read this first. No, really, because people, the closer to the front something is, the more people want to skip it. That's just sort of human nature. And I go through and cover all the things that I think are important or interesting about Elixir. And as you can see, some of the chapters are completely finished. There's like uh, nine of them that are completely finished and, you know, five or six that are, you know, in progress and then some that are barely started. But all this is just to say that you may have forgotten me, but I haven't forgotten you. This book is still being worked on and it is still going to be a thing. And that is all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hal. Thank you so much. All right, so up next we have Isaac. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, welcome to the Lenny Talks. I'm very curious about the most important Visual Studio Code snippet uh, for Elixir. So please tell us. Yes. So this is the most important uh, VS Code snippet you could possibly use if you're uh, an, an Elixir developer. So, and here's how, so you can find this at HTTPS uh, slick bit, slick dot bit slash bits dot 70. I wanted to help promote uh, somebody in our Elixir community who spun up a website. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this code. Uh, so let's just do this uh, snippet dot pipe. And it's just a silly little pipe that I wrote to make a point. Um, and you know, you look at that code, you kind of expect it to give three. Uh-oh, it gave five. What did I do wrong? How would you diagnose this? Well, this is what this VS Code snippet does. I'm gonna do a multi-line highlight and type three characters and boom, I've got IO and specs down the entire thing. Isaac, okay, Isaac, I believe that you're not sharing the, the coding. You're just sharing, uh, oh, sharing the, the, the Chrome. Shoot. Yep. Uh, I, let, me, let me share the right thing. Yeah, 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 sorry for interrupting. No, that's, that's uh, well, that's, that's my bad. Um, one second. I was so excited to go that I totally shared the wrong thing. Okay, there you go. So you should you should see the code. Yeah. So yeah. um so let's 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 run this. Um snippet that pipe foo. It's just a silly pipeline. I just wrote it to make a point. If I if I uh, run this pipeline, you get something that you might not expect. So you might have to debug it, right? Or why is this five? Okay, so now I'm gonna do a multi-line highlight and type in three characters, and it has dropped io.inspects everywhere. And then if I recompile and then run it again, now I can see, you know, you know how io.inspects work, and you can see exactly what the problem was. Um, all right, and the great thing about the snippet is that the way that it crafts io.inspect almost all the time, they'll be the same length, so you can ninja it out like that, and it's gone. And that's all I have to say. Go check out Slickbits. It's a pretty cool. I'm not affiliated, but they're they're in the Elixir community, so you know, help support them and have a good rest of the uh, rest of the uh, conference. Thank you so much. That was really fast and useful. Jorge, maybe you should turn down your camera and tell us what are you working on. <laughs> your online talk. I think you're on mute, Jorge. Sorry, Francia, you missed it. I already said it. Oh, no, I missed your line talk. That's a yeah, shame. My, my 10 second line talk. <laughs> OK, so I believe we have Glu Brian Glusman in the room. Hello. Hello. Hey, Brian. Um, let me uh, share my screen. I, I, there's, not, um, there's not any slides for this. And it's a very, very um, lightly structured talk, if structure is even the word. <laughs> But uh, I did some cool work over the last year, uh, mostly in um, May, June, July, um, on uh, a new feature for Live Dashboard and then a new project based on that feature. Um, and I figured it was worth a lightning talk. Um, um, 
So the project uh, for anyone who's interested is called Live Dashboard History. Um, and it's mostly based on work I did uh, on a pull request into Phoenix Live Dashboard to get um, to add support so that when you open um, the, the metrics tabs in, um, in Live Dashboard. So most people by now probably hopefully have heard about Live Dashboard. It's really cool. Um, it's been out for, it was announced um, sometime, you know, I think in January or February. Um, and when it came out, I thought it was really cool. But I thought one thing I was sort of disappointed by was the fact that you had to um, come to the metrics page and you had all these cool metrics there. When you came there, they had no data. They would only um, show you the data that was already live that, that came in while you were connected. And I thought, well, you know, we have stateful processes in Elixir. We should be able to store a buffer of recent data to show people. We shouldn't, you know, wait until they're there to have anything to show them. Um, and there were some good reasons that uh, Jose and Mike and everyone decided not to do this initially because this, the statefulness of where to store this data was a big question. It could take up a lot of memory. Um, but they were open to the idea of having a hook to uh, allow you to bring your own storage mechanism to the data. So by default, in Live Dashboard, there's still no history, but um, there's a pull request that came in that mostly made really not a huge number of changes, but I had to work kind of hard with Jose and, and um, over a series of iterations to get something that they were happy with um, to allow us to call out to an arbitrary process to get the data for a given graph. Um, most of those changes were made here in this file in Metrics Live. Uh, I can walk through the code a little bit and, and um, show you if people are curious, but the end result, um, there's a, a, in Phoenix Live Dashboard, there's a guide um, on using metrics history. It's part of the, the main uh, library now. Um, and there's also in the built-in dev environment for Live Dashboard, there's um, a sample implementation called Demo Web History. And this is a very, very simple um, gen server that can store the state of all of your um, metrics charts um, in memory, you know, ephemerally for up to some number of, of um, the history buffer size, whatever this number is. Right now it's storing 50 events per thing. You can just change that number and make it larger. My project is largely um, sort of a fork or an expansion of this thing I built to, to test live dashboard here uh, and make it a little more general so that you can, um, without having to write, copy paste all that code, you can just do two pieces of config, um, copy in, modify your live dashboard here by adding metrics history, live dashboard history, metrics history, and, and the module for your router. Um, and this is largely, the module is only there so that if you happen to have an umbrella app or an application with multiple routers in it, you can have um, a separate history configuration for each router. Um, since this lives in your router, and this is where Live Dashboard config comes in. We wanted to leave this coming in the same way. And then you have to add to your um, Elixir app config, um, either if it's only one router, um, the router and the metrics um, uh, module that you're using here. Uh, if you have multiple routers, you can pass in a list of maps. Each map can have router and metrics keys or these other keys. Um, the, the upshot is when you um, have my extension running or some other, if you wanted to store your state in Redis, you could very easily fork or modify the same idea of what's happening here, build a little adapter either with my library or otherwise and store your, your state, uh, your history in Redis and then serve it from Redis into, into Live Dashboard. Um, the sample implementations that come with this are only um, are only there to um, to store in the gen server and to store either a map or, or actually you can do ETS, I think, based on um, one of the dependencies is um, this um, um, CBUF. And CBUF has an ETS, um, a map, and uh, a, a queue. I think that it influenced it, and that's a circular buffer. Um, I also um, built a very small test suite for um, Live Dashboard History using Norm to do um, property testing, because I mostly, it's not actually a great use case for property testing, but um, I was curious to have a good excuse to play with it. So basically, I'm generating arbitrary telemetry events here. Um, 
has a, a cited schema from norm. And then I do a check all to say, generate all kinds of different schemas and metrics specs um, and all the different buffers we support from um, CBuff library. And just make sure that when you, um, when you emit telemetry metrics um, um, with the, the um, telemetry events we've defined, um, and ex sorry, you define those metrics for those telemetry events and then execute them, that the live dashboard returns something that's not an empty list. So it's very, it's very agnostic of exactly what's coming back. It's not checking correctness because all it's doing is storing and forwarding the events, but it tests a number of different cases that we support here. And it's sort of a fun use of norm and property testing to test something very general. Um, the, if anyone wants to, to play with this, um, the, um, uh, I have a live dashboard demo project um, that is um, uh, called live dashboard history demo. Um, it's linked, I think, on the live dashboard project um, here um, to make it easy to just play with it locally. Um, maybe, I, maybe I don't link to it here. I need to add a link into my readme here. Um, it's literally just... Um, Sorry, it's literally just uh, the same thing, underscore demo. Um, and that's, that's what I'm running here. Um, you can see if I refresh the page here, it will eventually reload basically the same data you're seeing. You also can play with it. Um, it, it takes a moment to load, but here, this is, this is the, the data we changed. It's not the exact same data, because the browser will hold more data than the number of events we're buffering, that any new connections come in will get the recently buffered history. Um, similarly, uh, I also open used um, that shout out to um, Sean uh, Doomsport. Uh, ElixirCompanies.com is an open source um, playground for the community to use, and their live dashboard is public for everyone to see. So I actually added. Um, live dashboard history there and sort of developed my fork against their thing to get it in production before the um, the actual um, thing was merged in. So we could use my fork of live dashboard while it was in development, get real data on how much memory usage it was affecting. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's not particularly um, top on memory, largely due to some suggestion from Jose to only store the processed events and not store the raw telemetry events. Um, so it's pretty much just storing almost the exact raw data you'd see here for each chart. Um, and Ryan? Yeah, sorry, we out of time? Yeah, yeah, yeah we are we're, uh, out of okay. time, but uh, is there any any link or something that you, you wanna share? Uh, yeah, sure, uh, I, can, um, I can post the uh, link to the project. Should I paste it in, into the uh, chat? I'll stop sharing and um, paste it in here. I, I don't know, I guess people on the web can't see the Zoom chat, so I don't. Know yeah, how to... I think that they they are not gonna be able to to see the link. Well, but what's your Twitter? Twitter is a good. Oh, well, my Twitter is uh, B Glusman. Uh, there you go. At B Glusman. <laughs> um, Perfect. And uh, anyone with questions or or uh, suggestions, welcome. But uh, otherwise, it should be hopefully pretty easy to to use and uh, hopefully it's interesting. All right. Well, Thanks. that was great. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks. Bye. I think that's it, Francia. I think we are done with the lightning talks. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, anything else, Jorge, that we are missing? I don't know. Keep using Elixir. <laughs> <laughs> OK, bye, everyone. Bye-bye.